share a couple of things before we Skype with uh, our missionary friends in Romania, and uh, Justin and Sarah White, and uh, he's going to be Skyping with us. And uh, probably what I do all do is have everybody kind of scrunched together when I'm finished here so that he can see everybody because <laughs> it'll be the, the laptop camera. So don't get too comfy where you are. You can go back to your spots after we're done Skyping if you want. But uh, we're going to Skype in, uh, with Justin, uh, and they're going to share what they're doing in Romania. There are Assemblies of God missionaries in Romania. have been there two years, um, almost two years, and they'll be coming home to furlough in four months. And uh, so we're hoping to maybe have them come in person uh, when they're here during their, their uh, itinerary um, time. So they're going to be sharing with us. Then we also have a video from uh, Mark and Fred Alston. They're missionaries to the Philippines with the Assemblies of God. We went with them and a team from Friendship Assembly back in 2009 in uh, Tacloban City and the islands of Leyte and Samar, which have been devastated, almost completely destroyed because of this typhoon Haiyan. Um, that they call Yolanda, which is weird. Um, but anyway, it's killed so many people. Over 4,500 people already have been confirmed dead. And I believe, many believe they'll be close to 10,000 by the time they're done. And uh, they're going to share a little bit about what's uh, going on. They've been there over 28 years. And I want to share a, a video that they just recently posted and uh, share about their ministry. And then Karen Clack is also going to be sharing uh, about the opportunity that she has uh, at the end of our service you know, want, want us to be challenged in the area of uh, world evangelism and missions today. So why is missions, why is world evangelism so important in these last days? I just want to look at a couple of scriptures and then uh, we'll Skype with Justin. Uh, the Great Commission, right? The Great Commandment, Jesus said, uh, when the lawyer asked him, what's the greatest commandment of all the commandments? Trying to trick Jesus, hoping to trap him by asking him that question. How many know that most of the time when people did that, it didn't turn out well? It usually ended up turned back on their heads. And so we need to not question what God's Word says and try and use God's Word um, for our benefit as a manipulation tool on our part, like this lawyer did. We need to take God's Word for what it says and apply it in our lives. And uh, Jesus tells the lawyer what? The greatest commandment is Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, body, and strength. Second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And if we're living in that, we're, we're pleasing the Lord. All the law and the prophets, Jesus said, hangs on these two commandments. And if we'll do that, we're pleasing the Lord. But then he also mentioned in the end of Matthew, um, right before he went up into heaven, he mentioned the great commission. All right, It wasn't the great suggestion, how you know. The great commission, that word commission means it's a calling. And you know what? There's not just a few who are called. What does the Bible say? Many are called, but few are chosen. Maybe you're not one that God's chosen to send to the Philippines or to Romania or to Africa or to some foreign country, but all of us are called to be a part of the Great Commission. It's not a suggestion. It's really a commandment that we go. And, um, you know, the Great, the great Commission, uh, it's the command of God for us to be involved in world evangelism, to be involved in missions. And it says this, I think we have it on the, on the screen already. Uh, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So Jesus tells us, again, not a suggestion, but a calling. A compassion that came straight from his heart, from the authority that he had within him as a sinless son of God. He says, go and do what I've been doing. Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't ask us like some so-called leaders in our life on earth? <laughs> he doesn't call us to go do things that he didn't do himself. There are a lot of leaders who expect things of us and they haven't done it themselves. And it's hard to respect that kind of leader, isn't it? They're not really a leader. Leaders should go first, right? And Jesus was that kind of leader. He's a leader that went first. In fact, he went to a greater degree than probably most of us could ever go in, in winning souls and reaching people for the kingdom of God. But he tells us, he's commissioning us. He's knighting us, if you will, with his sword and saying, the things that I've been doing, you need to do. John 14, 12, and greater things. Because I go to my Father and he's going to send us the Holy Spirit. We need to be involved in the Great Commission, in missions and world evangelism because it's the command of God. And number two, I want us to consider that the reason why we need to be involved 
in missions and world evangelism in these last days is the time is short. Do you believe that? The time is short before Jesus returns for his church. Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16. It says this, See then that you walk circumspectly, in other words, keeping your house in order, um, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. In another translation, it says, Making the most of every opportunity, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We've got to make use of every opportunity that God brings our way. If we're selfish, if we're self-centered, looking at our own things in life, and that's all we're focusing on, or the temporary things that aren't really going to matter when the trumpet sounds, we're going to miss opportunities. And I have to tell you today as a pastor, the opportunities that you have in front of you in this service today for missions and world evangelism, the people that are going to speak are of eternal value. They're the silver, gold, and precious stones that you can lay on the foundation of Jesus Christ. That when you get to heaven, there's a lot of things like the children's church song says that you can't take to heaven. But investing in world missions and world evangelism is how you can redeem the time and make the most of an incredible opportunity. Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. We can hasten, I believe. Maybe I'm taking too much liberty there. I don't know. You, you decide. But I believe that means we can hasten the return of the Lord by being involved, by fulfilling the Great Commission, by being involved in missions and world evangelism. Jesus is waiting. What is he waiting for? It's not because he's lazy. It's not because of a lot of the excuses that we may have for not being involved and being ready. God's ready. And he, Jesus is just waiting for the Father to say, go and get my children. Uh, but he's waiting. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so that's why we need to be involved. It's a command of God, and Jesus is coming back soon. And so I want us to be challenged with that. I'm going to set up the Skype real quick and uh, try and share with Just, Just, Justin's going to share. He's actually at a, at a service at an international church in Romania, and he's going to come out in the lobby and, uh, and speak to us for uh, about 10 or 15 minutes, just sharing what they're doing in Romania. Their heart is really for children and, and teens, and I'll let him share a little bit about what's going on with that. So give me a second. If you could, because everybody move over to where Curtis and Pamela are. They won't bite. We can all move over to this side. Uh, that way they, he can see everybody in the Skype, and uh, we'll try and get him on the screen. So you'll see him on the screen, and he'll be able to see you on that. Okay, give me a second to set it up. Can we move, like, to the four chair? these four chairs? So if you're more than four chairs, this way. Yeah, fill in, because you guys know web cameras. They're not real broad. The further back you go, the wider you'll get, but like these front rows are kind of tricky. Move the cart. Can you pull, move the cart with me? Because the cart's not going to matter as much. Well, never mind. We'll move this for a little bit. Leave it right there. We'll figure it out. We have tethers, so we're going to have to. <coughs> yeah. Okay, let's see what we can get here. Smile pretty, look friendly. It'll just be Justin. I don't think it'll be anybody else watching him, but we'll get him on here. Okay. We need to drag him over here. There he is. We need to be unmuted. No. Justin, the, this is my wife, Sarah. Hi. 
This is our third child here, Charity. She was born here in Romania almost months now. The other two kids are running around, so we might get them over here in a minute. Um, both Sarah and I were called to missions at a young age. Uh, she was 12 and I was 13. And so for us, this has been a lifelong journey. And uh, we went to Southeastern University in Florida and uh, the Lord, I was a, when I was 15, I moved to Romania as a missionary kid. And so the Lord actually called me back here. And um, missions, I believe, is the heartbeat of God because the, the greatest commission, as you've already talked about, was go everywhere and, and preach the gospel and share Jesus' love from your neighbors to all the way here in Constanza, Romania, on the Black Sea. And uh, not everybody's called to leave their country and leave their family, but those of us that are, um, support from you guys is super important. We've been here a little over two years, and uh, when we got here, we were living in the capital city, and um, we were praying, Lord, where do you want us to go in Romania to have the biggest impact? Our hearts have always been evangelism, reaching the lost, and we started praying. And uh, I had a couple cities on the map, the southern part of Romania. The southern part of Romania is the, uh, the you hear my kids screaming in the background, uh, is the least evangelized in the whole country. So I had a couple, couple cities that I had picked out, and I prayed, and I fasted. And I just didn't get a piece about any of them. And a week later, I said, Sarah, we really need to pray and fast. And we started uh, fasting on a Thursday morning. Some friends came to visit and told us about what God was doing in Constanza. And Constanza was not on our map at all. And God told us in that moment, he said, go there. And uh, where we're at now is the least evangelized in the whole country. It's kind of a forgotten land. It takes, um, it's three hours from nowhere. <laughs> And people only come here during the summer. You've got about three months where the place is packed full of tourists, and the rest of the time it's like a it's like an empty town compared to what it is during tourist time. But this area is just littered with uh, Muslims that have come up from Turkey and generational Muslims that have that have lived here for years. It also has the highest diversity as far as different cultures. And so when the Lord calls us down here. Um, there was a church planting project that we teamed up with the pastors here who were church planting and they have a vision, the pastors here, to plant a church in every village. Some of the villages have opened their doors. Some of them, they go into the city just to do prayer walks and the Orthodox priest kiss, kicks them out and don't let them uh, even in the city. And so uh, the Lord's call us here in 2015, when we come back, we're coming back in April, but when we come back here, the Lord's called us to open a dream center here in Constanza, in the main city, uh, it's littered with students, uh, high school students, college students from all over the world. And tonight we were at the International Church and the, uh, the internet wasn't working, so we rushed home to make sure we had internet. And, uh, but a few weeks ago, uh, it's, this International Church is mainly student-based. There were 17 different nationalities there. And uh, we had students coming in from outside, high school students that had never been in an evangelical church in their life came in because they heard the music and they heard we were having free pizza. And then we had a couple of Muslim girls that had never been in, a, in an evangelical church wearing the whole head covering like this. And then it came in and they've come back two weeks in a row now. And so God is moving in this area and uh, the Lord has laid it upon our heart to reach these students. And these students come in from all different type villages and they go here to go to college, and uh, our goal is, is when we reach them through this center, which will be a day center where they can come and uh, they can study. They, everybody's got kids, knows what it's like. <laughs> hey, children, come here. And, uh, and so with these students, we want to make a, play, a safe place for them to come every day. And, uh, and through that, we're going to build a relationship. Mm -hmm. Noah, can you say hi? Hi. Can you say hi? Hi. This is Noah. This is our oldest, Hannah. Come here. Hey, oh, this is Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Hey. Okay. Let's stand there. Okay. <laughs> we thought, uh, when we were itinerating before, many people asked us, well, what are you going to do with your kids? Where, who's going to watch your kids? I said, they're going with us. There's tons of kids in Romania. So. Yeah. <laughs> 
But uh, the Lord's called us to open this center, and uh, it'll be a place where students can come every day to study, do, do group studies. We'll have a little cafe there. Every uh, couple nights of the week, we'll have services, uh, different events where they can come in and experience the presence of God. And, uh, and through building that relationship, a lot of these students that come in from the village, when they go back to their village, we want to connect them with a church that, uh, that is being planted in that village. And so when we're reaching these students, we're not only reaching foreign students, we're not only reaching Romanian students, we're reaching students that are coming from the villages. And uh, it'll, it'll, it will work and coincide where it, it helps the, the churches build uh, their church planning project in the villages. And so hopefully through this door, the villages that don't have an open door where either the Muslims don't want us starting a church or the Orthodox church doesn't want us going in there. Um, if we can get a student from that village that gets saved and, and uh, on fire for Jesus, then we have an open door at that village then to start or maybe a home group there. So uh, this, is, this is our two main focuses that are going to be here in Romania is reaching these students for Christ uh, all the way from just your Romanian students and the Muslim students that we, we've had recently and uh, missions is so important for what Christ has called us to do we're called to be here our heart is to be here as, as long as God wants us and at this point I'm one of those that has a plan I have a 10 15 year plan and I hope that it's longer here and when, when churches in the states uh, get behind the missionary and support them not only in prayer because since we've been here uh, my son was trampled by a horse twice oh, wow. Within a five-minute period and almost died and uh, it was the one day we wanted to leave the country when we had to go to four hospitals to try to get him a, a CAT scan and um, uh, x-ray We've had instances um, Where we were in a wreck last winter on the main highway and the Lord protect us and there we need prayers We need your prayers each and every day just Sometimes we go grocery shopping and it's just too much. <laughs> the different culture with the different money and the different way that they do things and, and the different brands of food, food and all those different type of things. And so missionaries need your prayer, we need your support because without you guys, we can't be here fulfilling what God has called us to do. Yeah, awesome. Hey, can you talk a little bit, Justin, about the Orthodox Church and, and uh, the difficulties there just so that our people can know how to pray and maybe maybe also you mentioned it briefly but maybe the Muslims and how how maybe we can pray differently for those two groups and the openness like they talked about the other day yeah the Orthodox Church here is is basically based out of a, a legalistic mentality you show up you light candles you pray to the dead once a year you bring food to the dead um, and you pay money to get to heaven and um, they really use it to control the people. Um, a lot of the Romanians now are even having hard feelings towards the Orthodox Church for the things they're doing. Now they're mixing in mysticism within the church, magical things and different things like that. And uh, the, your everyday Romanian Orthodox doesn't know anything from the Bible. They only know what they're told when they show up to maybe a mass. And, uh, and the biggest thing they do is, is they cross themselves, they, they light some candles, even your most, uh, um, your most religious Orthodox really doesn't know what the gospel says. But we're hoping that through this center, we, uh, we can have, um, build a connection with the Orthodox Church and uh, with the church we're working with now, we've already, they've already got some good connections with the Orthodox priests going into the jails. And we'll, we'll actually even have the Orthodox Priest come and speak to the students to start building that rapport and building that relationship to bridge that gap. Because uh, as of now, even though you're born Orthodox, um, they'll make fun of you if you're a, a born again Christian. Here they have a word, it's called pokaita, and it means repenter. So if you're not Orthodox and you're considered a born again Christian, they call you pokaita. It's like making fun of you. And so what we've, uh, what I've what we need prayer for is that a revival within the Orthodox Church, that they would start preaching the Word of God and put away the mysticism that gets intertwined with it, and that these Orthodox priests would have a relationship with Jesus, and it not be just about the laws and regulations. And uh, that through this center, it being, it being just a day center for students to come and study, have internet, print stuff out, um, you know, have a place for them to have a safe place, that we can build a relationship with the, even the Orthodox Church and um, and be able to bridge that gap. As far as the Muslims here, um, 
almost every village you go to, you're going to see a mosque that's higher than any of the church steeples. And the Muslim's mentality is, is that we want to be seen above everybody else. And even the Muslims here, there's, there's not radical Muslims. They're generational Muslims. So they're only Muslims because their parents and their parents and their parents before them were Muslims. I met a guy in a village, and I went, we were doing a prayer walk, and I bought a turkey from him. I'm a, originally an Alabama boy, so every once in a while I have to go buy a farm animal. And um, I, he asked what we were doing in the village, and I said, well, we're walking around your village and we're praying for you. And he said, uh, well, I'm Muslim. And I said, well, that's okay. And I said to him, I said, you know what? I serve the God of Abraham. You serve the God of Abraham. And he doesn't know anything about his Muslim religion other than he was born and raised Muslim. And automatically I built a tie with this guy and he hugged me and, and we were friends. We were friends for life after that. And so uh, we have a mission school right around the corner from here. And they're actually sending out Romanian missionaries to Muslim countries. And these students are coming in for two years and they're being trained how to reach Muslims because a Romanian can go to a Muslim country where America cannot. And so God is doing amazing things in our area. And some of these students have graduated. We're working with them. They have a heart for the Muslims here in Romania. And so uh, uh, pray for these two these two girls that came and pray that I, I know that they, they keep coming back because they feel the presence of God and they know there's something think different there and uh, pray that uh, we can build relationships with these generational Muslims that don't know why they're Muslims and that they can uh, find a relationship with Jesus yeah. Amen. can I put your kids on the spot yeah that's fine that's perfect they, please if they haven't been quiet at all <laughs> could they sing something to us in Romanian oh uh, let's see or say something Oh yeah, they can definitely say something. <laughs> There's no, no shortage on ability to talk, right? Yeah, or they don't shut up. <laughs> I'll say while he's getting their kids, uh, Justin and I, and Sarah actually as well, were youth pastors together in Florida and uh, several years back, and we went on a missions trip together to the country of Belize, and I worked with Parker Dickerson down there, and uh, yeah. I just know from that trip and, and the times that we got together that Justin and Sarah really have a heart for children and for kids and teenagers and uh, God's using them in incredible ways and then probably none of us thought we'd be where we are now back then and Belize. Uh, but uh, our, our making gravy skits and our uh, things that we did down there I'm sure you're getting good use out of those there in Romania. Uh, definitely definitely okay can you say something in Romanian to them? What do you know? She's only shy when she wants to be. Yeah. No, Noah, come here and say something in Romanian to everybody. Can you tell us in Romanian? Hola. Say it more camera. Me llamo Noah. Noah. Do you want to sing this to Joe's song? Joe's song. Stinga data, swing stones. Stinga data, we do, we do, we do. All right. Do you want to say something? language it's just up down left right look 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 um, they uh they, they've been able to pick up the language a little bit they, they went to uh to kindergarten here and they ended up teaching the kids english so uh, and, and their teacher spoke to them mainly in english but uh when you greet a brother and sister in the lord in romania you say pace pace okay pace it means peace okay so I've taught them to say pace a fada, which means peace out. So. Peace out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Uh, that's funny. Well, hey, uh, uh, thank you guys for sharing and uh, and uh, being a part of our first first ever uh, missions emphasis for our church, and uh, we're excited uh, excited about what God's doing for you. Um, why don't I close out praying for you guys? Is that okay? And then uh, yes, please. Thank we'll be in touch. I've got your uh, newsletter information that we're gonna put in people's hands, and uh, hopefully we can connect again when you guys are here itinerating. Okay, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Let's pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, God, today for Justin and Sarah and their family. God, I thank you for how you're using them in Romania to touch the lives of children and kids and college students. Lord, I just pray that you'll give them a harvest of souls that's greater than anything they've ever imagined. God, I pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit to break through the barriers that the enemy is trying to put up. Barriers of finances, barriers of, of uh, cultural differences, God, barriers of uh, the Orthodox Church. Uh, Lord, I just pray that there would be openness, God, that there would be breakthroughs in each one of these areas. And God, that your work can go forward. God, that your work can progress. And Lord, that we can see many souls come into the kingdom in these last days. Lord, I just pray for favor. And God, for influence upon uh, Justin and Sarah and their family. God, use them in their neighborhood, use them in the churches, use them in every opportunity that they have with outreach. God, I pray for support from teams from the states would come and, and help them in what they're doing. And God, challenge us as a church on how we can pray and how we can get involved in, uh, in what they're doing, partnering with them there in Romania. And God, we just thank you for that. Bless them. Give them a good week this week. And uh, thank you for allowing us to be able to communicate with them and to get a heart for missions and world evangelism. Give us your heartbeat, Jesus, we pray. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, thank guys. You. I appreciate you taking Blessing. the time and rushing home to do this. We'll be in yeah, touch. No problem. We'll be in touch. God bless you guys. Okay. Goodbye. Okay. Now I'm going to get Monica back to where she can do what she does. Was that pretty cool? Yeah. <laughs> he says the, the internet actually in Romania is way better than most places in the United States. And uh, that's unusual because when we Skyped with the Philippines before, it's awful. <laughs> it's probably even worse now because of the hurricane. But he said they have really good internet. If they, if they have nothing else, they have really good internet. So, uh, all right. Well, thank you guys for doing that. And uh, I know it's a blessing for them to be able to see some people from the States and to know that we're praying for them. And uh, we do have some, uh, one of their newsletters, it's just a one-page newsletter. And uh, if you uh, are interested, I challenge each one of you, whether you're, you're gonna give or whether you're just gonna pray, grab one of these sheets and uh, put it in your Bible, put it in a place uh, where you pray at home and uh, lift them up in prayer. They have three children there, a baby that was just born a few months ago, and. Uh, so they need our prayers, and it tells a little bit about what they're doing. It has their contact information. So there's some of those on the back table, and uh, make sure you you uh, grab one of those. Um, I want to share just a couple of other things, and then we're going to look at a um, at a uh, video from the Alstons and talk about the Philippines. Um, we talked about the Great Commission. Another thing about world evangelism and missions, you heard it a little bit in, in what Justin was sharing. You'll hear from Karen as well on the Alstons. In their video but there's an incredible sacrifice that's made for souls and uh, our missionaries are making a huge sacrifice um, we have uh, if you have that PowerPoint Monica um, Jim Elliott how many have ever heard of Jim Elliott before it's gonna be the second one Monica the second power that's the one yeah Jim Elliott uh, was a missionary um, many years back to um, Ecuador and he went to the uh, Quechua I think is how you say it Indians and they were very uh, in a very remote area of Ecuador, never had been seen somebody from the civilized world for, for ever in their entire uh, history as a, as a people. And uh, he went down there and actually ended up sacrificing his own life along with one of his missionary uh, friends because of the call of God upon his life. He felt the commission, the call of God upon his life was so strong. And he's the one that made the phrase that many of you have probably heard, he is no fool 
who gives what he cannot keep to gain um, that which he cannot lose. And yes, you give up money, you give up comforts, you give up a lot of things to be a missionary and take the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you know what? You gain in incredible rewards in heaven, people being reached with the gospel, and that's why we need to be involved as well. Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30, it says this, So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands or for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. So yes, we may have to make some sacrifices for the sake of the gospel. And you know what? It may come here. It may come to the United States where it's more than just somebody laughing at us because we're a Christian. It may come to where there's persecution. That's real persecution, third world kind of persecution. And are we ready? Is our faith strong enough in the Lord that we're willing to make that kind of commitment? But there's missionaries all over the world who are making that kind of commitment, that kind of sacrifice. And if they're doing that for the sake of the gospel, and Jesus made an incredible sacrifice, didn't he, on the cross? When he died, he made an incredible sacrifice. Why did he do it? Why would Jesus go to the cross? Because he loved mankind and wanted to see them saved. Why did these missionaries go? Because they have the love of God in their heart. And they want to see people saved just like Jesus does. And so we need to be a part of that, be behind it as a church. And if we're going to see um, blessings upon our church, it's got to be more than just our four walls. Us four and no more. Amen. It's got to be bigger, a bigger vision than just our city. Our city desperately needs Jesus, and we need to do everything that we can, and we have been with outreaches. We need to look and say, God, how can we reach the uttermost parts of the earth with the gospel? We may be small. We may not have the resources that a larger church has, but that doesn't mean we can't be involved in missions, and so we need to be a part of that. Uh, if we have that video, Monica, Mark, if you'd like go ahead and play that. Hello. We're Mark and Freda Alston. We're Assemblies of God Missionaries. And we're, we live in Tuckloban City, Lathe, where that typhoon Yolanda just hit and uh, caused so much damage and devastation. Our home of 28 years has been there. Our home is just a few feet, maybe 20 feet from the water. 16 foot of water surge came into the house. I'm sure everything, well, I'm not sure exactly what happened. The house is probably still standing, but everything is ruined. But mostly we're concerned for Trini, the lady that was there watching the house. We told her to evacuate. We're not sure if she did. Please pray for Trini. There's no communications. There's just one sat phone that they're using for emergency purposes in Tuckloban. Please pray that uh, they'll get the airport repaired as soon as possible so we can get relief goods in and also a road open so they can bring other uh, relief goods in. If we don't do this, uh, children will start dying within days without good water and food. The Convoy of Hope does have good food packages uh, that can feed uh, someone and some water filters that do an amazing job if we can just get there. There'll be a link to give to help provide for these uh, water filters and these food packs uh, on this video. We're free, but mainly please pray that the governor, we're not even sure if he's a Christian, the Philippine governor said that all that we can do is pray, pray, and pray. So please pray for uh, Tacloba in a city. They say 200, but it's 400,000 people and probably a million people have been affected. They're all, their homes have been totally destroyed all along the coast, a mile inland, every home. Please pray for the people of Tacloban. We've been told this morning that there is minimal food and water. It won't last for more than a day at the most. So please pray for the people. There's incredible suffering. They're still recovering many bodies, and I'm sure they will continue to recover bodies for many days. We're going to have some information uh, available that you can give specifically. Um, that's Mark and Freda. They've been there 28 years. What an incredible sacrifice. 
and their heart is for that nation. They've been all over the Philippines. Um, certainly Leyte, the island of Leyte, which is where Tacloban City is, which is a very large city. We, went, we landed there. The airport that we landed at in 2009, they were in Manila when they filmed this video, uh, which Manila is on another island. Uh, we flew from Manila, which is the international airport, to Tacloban City. The seaside airport is gone. It's decimated. It's under, it was underwater for a long time. If you go to CNN or Fox News, they're showing the military, U.S. military helicopters that are landing with the big crates of food and things. That's the, what's left of the Seaside Airport. And you see all the Filipino people pinned up against the chicken wire fence. That's the Seaside That's what's left of the Seaside Airport. Uh, which you can see there's not even a runway for uh, very many planes. That's why they're using Osprey. Uh, planes that can land straight up and down and helicopters to get people there. Incredible um, devastation that's gone on in the Philippines. And I, I want us to support people and admissions and the things that we're partnering with. I want to partner with people that I know their heart. I know what they're, they're, what they're doing is spreading the message of Jesus and the cross. And I know these people are. We, we partnered with them in 2009. And we went to a lot of remote villages on the island of Samar. And Samar is probably not going to make the international news because there's not big cities like Tacloban there. But there are a lot of people in remote areas that if they don't get helicopters in there, um, they're not going to get the food. Now, since this video was made, this was just a day or two after the hurricane had cleared out, um, they have gotten through an answer to prayer. Um, the Convoy of Hope truck has, gotten th has left Manila. Uh, the international airport and it has food and water filters fill, filled with food and water filters and to go from manila they have to, manila is like up here the, the philippines are a bunch of islands manila is on an island up north of where they are and then samar is kind of down and to the to the right uh, or your left um, looking at the map and then leyte is just below that so they're kind of like um, a comma if you will they have to take a truck there's no airfield they can't fly so they took a truck and they took a ferry. Can you imagine that? A truck that has like a UPS truck, sized truck, full of water supplies and food. They took a ferry, parked the truck on the ferry and rode the boat to the island of Samar because that's the only way that where the ferry goes. And then they got off on the ferry in Samar and drove. And it's like, if you've ever driven in um, Samar, it's like dirt roads. One time when we were on the island of Samar, there was this big boulder the size of four cars probably that had just rolled down the hill. Everything's dirt road, huge ruts in the road. There's only one paved road through all of the Philippines and it's not in Samar. <laughs> and uh, so they had to drive probably two several hours, two or three hours from where they got off the ferry to the bridge that goes from Samar into Tacloban. And you see the bridge on the news all the time. It's a big high rise bridge. The water is usually about 25, 30 feet below that bridge. And if you see the pictures right after the hurricane, the water was almost to the bottom of the bridge. That's showing you that how the seas had risen like 20 some feet. And they're gonna cross that bridge into Tacloban City. Um, they had gotten through, their biggest prayer with that was that everything you can imagine was clogged up because if that's the only way to travel, everybody's traveling that way. They got the Convoy of, truck, uh, Convoy of Hope truck through the ferry uh, station to Samar in 24 hours, very quickly. And they, they had expected to have to wait maybe up to 72 hours. They, they had traveled, I think they're already in Tacloban. They were able to get across the bridge. The other thing was the bridge, because there's armed bandits and gangs that are just, whoever has the most weapons wins right now because there's not a lot of order. They were able to get over the bridge. And so, praise God, food supplies and water filters. You know, people can go a little while without food. But without clean water, they, they can't go very long. And so continue to pray that that uh, is, is done well. And then some of the con uh, conversations that, uh, that uh, Freda had, the, the lady that was on the video, uh, with some people on Facebook, she says, make sh pray that the equitable distribution of the supplies takes place and that even the remote places are able to get the food, like the island of Samar, that they're able to get the food because a lot of times, um, the government is just corrupt, and they'll just take everything and they'll give it to the people that are close to them, and they don't reach the people in the remote areas. So pray for those things, and uh, um, we have some information on uh, the Alstons as well on the back table, just a half sheet that has their information. They're Assemblies of God missionaries, and take one of those, and if nothing else, to pray for them, and pray 
especially in this very difficult time, that God will use them. These people, I know them. And Mark is such a laid back. He's a surfer. He's been a surfer his whole life. He's very laid back. And you guys would enjoy talking to him if we could on Skype. But I'm sure he's busy taking care of needs. Um, but they're wonderful people taking the message of Jesus all over um, the area of the Philippines. And what huge opportunities they have right now. And we can invest in people that I know, I know are going to be doing a good work. And we're not losing 60% to administrative costs. Whatever we give or however we support these people, it's going to be 100%. And they're going to use it wisely and effectively because they've been there 28 years to make a difference. So be praying for them. Considering the sacrifices that missionaries are making around the world, what part do we have? In all of it. What are the sacrifices that God's requiring of us? Time and prayer? Maybe giving of our finances? If you think about those people, you see them on the news, it's like they've lost everything. How do you rebuild from that? We've seen some things similar to that in our own country. And we wonder how do people recover? They don't have the resources that the United States has for uh, you know the devastation that we've seen from Katrina, you know, which would probably be the closest equivalent to what they've had. They don't have the resources to rebuild like we do. And so we need to ask God, what's our part? Uh, we must enable and resource our missionaries and those ministries involved in world evangelism to honor their sacrifices. You know what? And then when this video was made, they didn't know yet, but their house was completely destroyed. Completely destroyed. All their possessions in their house, gone. And I don't know that they've heard from the trees yet. So continue to pray for their housekeeper. They did have a net center where they do ministry training on another part of the island. And they did get word that all of the staff at the Net Center was safe and accounted for. So praise God for that. But pray that, that God uh, works in that situation. They've made incredible sacrifices. I believe God's challenging us as a church to honor their sacrifices. And most of all, to honor the sacrifice of Jesus. Amen? Their sacrifices, our sacrifices would be nothing if it wasn't for what Jesus did on the cross for the whole world. And it's for the Filipino people. And let's let God um, challenge us. One other thing I want to highlight before I have Karen... Um, share this morning a, a missions organization that we're tied with the world evangelism organization Sun Life Broadcasting Network uh, I graduated from Jimmy Swaggart Bible College World Evangelism Bible College back in 1995 our church is a world evangelism fellowship affiliated church and that just means that we agree with what they believe that's pretty much the, the extent of the affiliation but we do believe that the message of the cross which is the heartbeat of Sun Life Broadcasting Network is the message that the world needs to hear. We've got a lot of um, denominations and ministries that are pushing a lot of programs. And programs are great as long as they're connecting people to Jesus and the cross. But we believe that the simple message of Jesus and what he did at Calvary is what the world needs. And you go to a third world country like the Philippines right now, they're not interested in our programs, are they? They're interested in food, water, shelter, and if Jesus can answer their prayers and help them. And so, uh, just some statistics on Sun Life Broadcasting. They're broadcasting to over 140 million homes right now, taking the message of Jesus uh, to people. And that's why it's important. The countries that they're currently in, and it's growing all the time, uh, Africa, Asia, Australia, Canada, the Caribbean, Germany, Israel, Latin America, and the United Kingdom, and of course the United States of America, which we probably needed as much as anybody. And uh, they're, they're beaming the, the message of Jesus in through satellites. So there's countries all over the world that are hearing the message of Jesus that maybe places a missionary cannot go. And you know what? As a church, I want to partner. I know personally lots of people. Uh, Curtis and Pamela know some people there as well. Their parents receive training there. I know people that are involved in this ministry. And I know that they're taking the money that's given and they're using it for the work of the kingdom. And those are the kind of ministries I want us to support when we talk about missions and world evangelism. Not just throwing money at something and hoping that they're doing something for God, but connecting with people and missionaries and ministries that we know are doing a work for the kingdom. And so uh, we have the information there, sunlifetv.com. Uh, there's also the radio station, which is the next one. If you go to Sun Life TV, it has the, the radio as well. And then also um, Direct TV Channel 344. They have 24-7 broadcasting of, of uh, Sun Life Broadcasting. So 